people that have had the greatest impact on our culture. And it, it's not any president that has ever served this nation. And it's not been a great general that has led our troops in, into battle, whether it be World War I, World War II, or any other wars. And it hasn't been, nor has it been, uh, the most brilliant of scientific minds. The, no, the greatest impact on our culture was done by an itinerant, homeless preacher that preached in the backwaters of the Roman Empire over 2,000 years ago. Who would have thought that the parable of the Good Samaritan would have such an impact, such lasting change on cultures? People love a Good Samaritan story. They publish it in the papers. They talk about it, the Good Samaritan. Uh, there's even spin-offs of the Good Samaritan story. Uh, for instance, on February 17th, 2019, 2019, you know what day that is? That is Random Acts of Kindness Day, where you, people are supposed to go out and do these random acts of kindness. We feel good about ourselves if we go out of our way to help someone else. The glamorization of Good Samaritan stories uh, kind of makes us forget of how messy it can be to be a Good Samaritan. How truly messy that might be, and how complicated it becomes at times. There's a story out of Philadelphia that made the national news, and I think it even made some international news, of a homeless man, homeless veteran, who gave his last $20 to a woman who had run out of gas for a car. So he gave the last, and that prompted her and her boyfriend to start a GoFundMe page for this homeless veteran in Philadelphia. And uh, they raised a whole bunch of money through this Go, GoFundMe page, but things started to go sour when they started distributing the funds and they uh, discerned that the funds might have been going to support this homeless veteran's drug habit. And so they stopped distributing funds. Well then things turned even worse after that because now it went to court to decide who has control of the GoFundMe page, who has control of the GoFundMe funds, whether it's the homeless veteran or this lady and her boyfriend that set up the GoFundMe account to begin with. So we like our Good Samaritan stories to have a happy ending. And uh, it doesn't always work that way. It doesn't always turn out nice and smoothly. If we look at the story of the Samaritan in Jesus' parable, it was messy business that he got himself into. Uh, Jesus tells this parable in response to a lawyer's question who was putting Jesus to the test. And uh, Jesus turns that around on the lawyer and says, well, how do you read it? What is it what you're supposed to do to inherit eternal life? Why well, do you read it? And so the lawyer gives the correct textbook answer. Love God. Love people. Love God. Love people. Pretty simple, right? But the lawyer knew this. He knew that if he was going to come anywhere close to fulfilling this, that he had to define neighbor in such a way as to limit the scope of who his neighbor is that he was going to love on, who he was going to care about that deeply. Years ago, we had an elderly man that lived right across the street from us. And one evening, I got, got a phone call from this elderly man. He said to me, I think I'm having some heart issues. I might be having a heart attack would you mind taking me to the hospital? And I said, no, not right now, I'm eating some ice cream. No, I, I, I went and took him to the hospital, obviously, right? Uh, it was a few weeks ago that we were suffering from uh, salmonella food poisoning, and I zombie-like went through our backyard to our neighbor's house that lives through the back of our backyard, 
And I asked her if she would take me to the hospital. And of course she did. And then not only did she take me to the hospital, but when she came back, she took my wife and my daughter Alyssa to the hospital after that as, as well, uh, as we were going through that. So of course, when somebody has a need like that, we help somebody. Who wouldn't help in, in those situations? But Jesus doesn't limit love of neighbor to a neighbor that we get along with, someone who lives next to you. He extended, extends that to everyone and anyone in your life's journey that you come across that has a need in their life. So Jesus tells this messy story. And the story goes like this, that there's a man, and I like the way he doesn't define anything about the man. This is a man who's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and Jerusalem's at about 2,500 feet in elevation. Jericho's about 800 feet in elevation. So you're literally going down. Very rocky trail, lots of places for uh, criminals to hide in, to waylay somebody, and that's exactly what happened to this poor, poor fellow. As he's walking down from Jerusalem to Jericho, people attack him, beat him, strip him, rob him, and he's left there, laying on the side of the road, half dead. And so now some other people come along. Levi, a priest, they pass by him. Now, it's easy for us to, to judge them quickly. But I was thinking of myself. I remember when I lived on Long Island years ago. And uh, I went to visit Stacy. Uh, this is before we were married. Stacy at her parents' place in Johnstown. I did this fairly regularly. I'd go from Long Island back to, John, to Johnstown, then Johnstown back to Long Island. It seemed like no matter when I left Johnstown to go back to Long Island, I would get stuck in traffic in New York City. If you know anything about my personality, I don't like that. It's just not I'm just getting fired up when that happens. And so I'm coming back home, I think it was a Sunday night, it's like midnight, and I'm on the cross, I get to the George Washington Bridge, go to the Cross Bronx Expressway, and I'm gonna stand still at midnight on the Cross Bronx Expressway. So the very, I was right here next, uh, an exit, and I just whipped off of there. I was just so angry. I was like, I just wanna get home. And I went smack dab into a very shady neighborhood. And there's people all over the place walking around, and I remember thinking to myself, I'm not stopping this car for anyone. And if anybody tries to stop my car, I'm running them down. <laughs> so much for compassion. So it was self-preservation mode that I was in, and, and, and that was it. Wasn't stopping for anything. Let, let, let me say, well, be honest with yourself, ladies. If you, were in that kind of, if you were in that neighborhood, and you saw somebody in need, would you get out of the car? To help them? Would you really do that? Would you get out of the car? Now, this is a different time and era. There was no cell phones back then when I was doing this. I'm sure most people would at least say 911, call, call and, and get some help for someone. But uh, to go out and personally help them? Eh, probably, probably not. Most of us would be thinking, oh, I gotta preserve myself. Um, <coughs> so, some of the things that people like to do on like random acts of kindness days is pay for the person's meal in the drive through behind you. Or pay for the toll of someone who's behind you. Let's be honest, there's really not that much risk in that. And it's really not that much sacrifice either. Jesus reminds us that to really love our neighbor at times is going to mean a lot of risk. And it's going to be a lot of sacrifice. Jim Elliott and four other missionaries went to the Amazon jungle back in the 1950s and to try to minister to the Wadoni tribesmen, and they were murdered. They were attacked by the tribesmen and murdered. Here's the thing. They had rifles. The uh, Jim Elliott and the missionaries had rifles. They refused to use those rifles because they did not want to kill somebody, even though they were being attacked, they didn't want to kill somebody that did not know 
Christ, send them into eternity without knowing Jesus Christ. So, here's the twist to that story. Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth, and another one of the missionaries' wives, Rachel, eventually went back there several months later, made contact with the Bodoni tribesmen, befriended them, moved in with them, shared the gospel with them, and some of the men who were the murderers of their husband came to faith in Jesus Christ. That's loving your neighbor. That's slightly more risk than paying for the person's meal behind me at Chick-fil-A. Slightly more. It's my observation that, that we as Christians are really good at talking about loving one another. We're really good at, 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 at talking about loving others. Until it comes down to actually having to do that in an actual situation that might put us at risk. It's, we all agree with it in theory. The problem comes when you and I are faced with an actual situation that, that we have to put it into practice, where there's real risk involved, where there's real inconvenience, and there's no chance of recognition. I've heard people who have become very indignant and angry when they've helped somebody and they said, that person never even thanked me. They went out and they helped somebody and, and, and they're just all up in arms that the person never thanked them. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Some of the help we provide to other people is really self-serving, if we're honest. Just so we can feel better about ourselves. The Samaritan took risk. He sacrificed of his time. He sacrificed of his money and expected nothing in return. That is who Jesus is pointing to as loving. Who loves like that all the time? Not I. And my guess is, if you're honest with yourself, not you either. The fact is, there is only one who loves like that, who does and did love like that. And the fact of the matter is that, folks, we are the person who is stripped and beaten and for all intents and purposes lying dead on the side of the road. There is nothing we can do to help ourselves. Our sin has stripped us of any pretense of self-righteousness we might have. We're naked, we're exposed, we're wounded before God and the world around us. The world passes us by, passes by us and offers us all kinds of advice, but it brings no relief to our condition. We're still dead in our sins. Self-help hasn't done it. After all, if you're laying there dead on the side of the road, how are you going to pick yourself up by your bootstraps? Religion hasn't done it. In fact, if anything, when people look at the institution of religion, they say, I don't want any part of that. Finally, there was the Good Samaritan who came along and took the risk of becoming just like we are, flesh and blood, being tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. He understands our condition. He risks walking with us for the purpose of sacrificing for us. And sacrifice he did. Not by putting us up in some hotel room for a few nights and maybe covering some of our medical expenses, but by giving us a transfusion that would cost him his life. Transfusion that would cost his very life. Exchanging his Righteousness for our sin, breathing life into this body of death, and after doing all that, receiving no thanks from billions of people. Over and over again, Jesus 
wasn't thanked by the majority of people. Remember when Jesus healed the ten lepers? How many of them came back to give thanks? One. One in ten come back to give thanks. We are piping mad when we, when we put ourselves out there to help someone and we have little or no thanks to show for that. Yet God has given everything, everything, held nothing back and barely receives thanks. Even from those who say we're his followers. How quick you and I are to grumble and complain when things don't go our, our way. What's going on? How can you let this happen, God? What are you doing? And kind of again, God bandages us up, washes our wounds, puts us on our feet, rejoices over us. What an amazing, good Samaritan our Jesus truly is. I wonder what State College would look like if we reflected a little bit of that through our lives. And with risk and with sacrifice, without thought of reward for ourselves, that we would love our neighbor in a way that Christ has loved us. And that has begun to happen, I believe, here. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the young man from, from China that was here for the last five or six week, uh, weeks, uh, Ben uh, is his name. I don't, I don't know his Chinese name, but I call himself Ben. And um, he came here, and I believe God directed him here, uh, and he's searching. He he's, goes to one of the premier uh, kind of equivalent of an Ivy League uh, university in China, uh, and he's studying for his PhD in physics. I'm talking to my nephew, who is a physics major uh, in the Philadelphia area, and he actually knew the university. He said it's the third ranked university in the world for physics, for studying physics, uh, this university in, in China. So he came in our, our fellowship here seeking something else. And um, this past Sunday, he gave a present to the church, which I'm going to show in a second. But uh, he also sent this email. He said this to me. Hi, Brian. I was truly, it, it was truly incredible to meet you, your family, and everyone at the church. You were all very kind to me. It gave me lots of memories that I know I'll be thinking of many years from now. I'll be on the plane home around the time that the 1030 service finishes to the plane going back to China. I can only hope that I'll never forget the questions that now dwell in my mind. And because of that, my life never falls into mere existence. I wish for all of you a pleasant and bright future. Hope we meet again. Best then. I emailed him back and I just said, Hi Ben, may the grace of Jesus fill your heart with joy. Be blessed, my friend. As the scripture says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you will be saved. In doing so, we will be sure of seeing each other again, if not in this life, then in heaven. That beautiful gift is for you. This PhD physics guy who was doing research here at Penn State for five or six weeks left this as a present. He took a picture of our church and then hand drew with pencil our church. And he's, he wrote some things in Chinese on the back, but I can't read it. So I'm going to get Doris in here. <laughs> We'll get this afterwards. Casey's yelling at me in this. I don't want to do it. Like, you're reading like, best, best of mine. I couldn't stand you, really. Like, that's what I wrote here. So, get the translation afterwards. But no, he did a beautiful, I mean, pencil. So he has, he has a lot of talent, right? Physics. And then, I can't draw anything in there. So, 
Very nice. Uh, and that's really why we're here. And that's what loving someone, loving your neighbor, looks like and the impact it has on our life. Uh, I remember riding back with him from uh, one of the church services. We had several uh, longer conversations, but one time I was just driving him off at, at the library in Penn State so he could do his research. And um, he said to me something along the lines of, um, when he's talking about materialism, he's talking about scientific materialism, like the material world is all there is. And he said, that has left me kind of empty. And so we started having a discussion about uh, entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. It was a great conversation on the, on the, on the way back to, to, the, uh, uh, to the library. But God is working in his life. And uh, I just pray that he would receive this gift uh, that God desires to give him. Uh, and it's through Jesus, our Savior. That's what we're here for. Uh, to love our neighbor. To point to Jesus, the good Samaritan, who gave everything for us. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence and we're thankful, Lord God, for the people that you do bring in our lives. And we don't know where they're at in their walk through the, this journey, through this life. And I pray for Ben that he would embrace the depth of the love that you have for him in and through Jesus. I pray that he would embrace that fully. We are so thankful for this congregation that showed him care and love while he was here. For those few weeks that he was here, that he was shown care and love. So I thank you, Lord God, for how you're moving through the people of Good Shepherd. And I pray, Lord God, that we would continue to follow Jesus, uh, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, and that he would empower us to love others as you have loved us. Pray this in his mighty name. Amen. So let's stand and, and confess our faith.